Um, thank you, Malcolm, and thank you, um, Invest in ME and Richard and Pia for inviting me for the fourth time. I, I, I was thinking, I said, what am I going to say for the fourth time in a row? And uh, we do have some new information, but I thought maybe I can, I, I did cut down the number of slides. I'm going to pre present, give you a little more concise summary of things and explain them a little more thoroughly so everybody will get something out of it. So we, we, at least we can come to understand what enteroviruses play in some of the patients. So let's get started with a case. That's how we clinicians understand an illness. Before I understood this illness, these symptoms meant nothing to me. And the only thing that I understood was, okay, you're tired now. Let's, let's gather the major criteria, the minor criteria, then you got chronic fatigue syndrome. We forgot what the importance of the initial infections. Now we start understanding, recognize the initial infection is important. So this is a history of a 19-year-old white female who developed a severe respiratory infection while attending college. Apparently the whole, everybody in the dormitory was sick and most of the people, the, the symptoms lasted about a month. The symptoms uh, also included intermittent right lower quadrant pain. That was where the areas, the appendix in about two weeks after the respiratory infection. This means something. She did have low-grade fevers, nice sweats, and fatigue, but she was able to function, probably functioning at about 80% normal. She managed to finish that quarter about May or so. But she continues to have increasing right lower quadrant pain. So in August of 2005, about nine months later, she went to see a gastroenterologist, and a CT scan of the abdomen actually showed thickening of the terminal ileum. Terminal ileum is the end of the small valve before it becomes the colon. And she also has right lower quadrant tenderness, as if she almost had appendicitis. And then a colonoscopy was done that showed nodular swelling in the terminal ileum, and a biopsy showed nonspecific changes. They were looking for lymphoma and Crohn's disease based on this finding. Here I can show you the swelling in this whole area here. Normally, it should look more like here. You can see all these little nodules here, and you can see a lot of swelling in here. Just make this quite simple that we did find enteroviruses uh, RNA in this tissue here, and we quantitated it using the quantitative RT-PCR technique. There were at least 50 to 100 million viruses in the swelling here. After this biopsy, this is what aggravated it. A week later, she developed severe weakness and fatigue, 102 fevers, drenching night sweats, body aches, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and marked leukopenia. The white blood cell count was extremely low, with the absolute neutrophil count was 350. Normally, it should be about 2,000 to 7,000 or so. We thought she had leukemia. She was hospitalized. I was, this is the first time I met her at this time. And um, we did a bone marrow biopsy, which was read out as normal. But we did detect enterovirus RNA in the bone marrow. We did a blood RNA test at this acute illness, which was negative. She was given two doses of IVIG, gamma I intravenous immunoglobulin, and she had improvement of her symptoms and fevers. The leukopenia, or the low white blood cell, improved. She was discharged af after seven days. Then she continued to have fatigue, body aches, headaches, functional dyspepsia, and IBS symptoms, thus the abdominal symptoms, but was able to function about three to four hours per day. After this four months, the patient basically lapsed into a severe case of MECFS. She was bedridden for the next how many years? When two years later, when we learned about the stomach biopsies and looking for the viral protein using immunostaining, we we're able to show the viral proteins in the stomach cells here. This is a lower, res uh, this is a 100x magnification, this is a 400 magnification. We also found enterovirus RNA in the stomach tissue, which was confirmed by sequence of the uh, new RNA, and she did improve after taking Chinese herb. She's now working about six to eight hours a day, um, functioning at probably about 70% of normal, but not 100%. Human enteroviruses are basically consist of more than 70 plus serotypes, and there are more than 100 of these genotypes. If you look at gene sequence, there are three famous polioviruses, 23 Coxsackie A, six Coxsackie B, 26 echoviruses, and now the next enteroviruses are given a number. 
Acute enterovirus infection, you've probably seen this before, but I was just going to make some comments on these, these inf infection uh, symptoms. There are about 30 to 50 million cases occur in the United States based on a study more than 10 to 15 years ago by the Centers for Disease Control. These cases tend to occur in epidemics. The relatively few virus infections occur in, in epidemics. Epstein-Barr virus typically does not occur in epidemics. Parvovirus can occur in small epidemics, but enoviruses typically occur in large epidemics. They can cause respiratory infections, be whether it's runny nose, sinus pain, sinus drainage, sore throat, cough, cough with shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain, and extensive pneumonia require ICU care and probably three, four weeks of hospitalization. We can actually grow the virus out of the tracheal secretions. Or follow by gastrointestinal infections, vomiting, diarrhea, in severe pain in the upper intestine areas, and the, the pain in the, the bottom of the small bowel called terminal ileitis. It can cause frank diarrhea, sometimes bleeding, liver infections, pancreatitis, acid reflux, and then subsequently to what we call functional dyspepsia or IBS. These patients can have prolonged fevers for three weeks, could be as high as 102 to 104 fevers, and actually accompanied by very little other symptoms. Some people will have severe myalgias, there are very mild respiratory or gastrointestinal symptoms, you have to look for it. A number of the patients develop leukopenia and lymphopenia, very profound leukopenia and lymphopenia. Bone marrow failure has been reported, especially in neonates, and it's much more severe immunodeficient patients. We've seen a number of transplant patients die from this virus infection. So these viruses can disseminate into the central nervous system to the meninges, the brain, the spinal cord, it can cause Guillain-Barre syndrome. Right now we saw five cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome in the hospital in the last two weeks after a respiratory infection. And it can cause epidemic vertigos. People present with very, very severe vertigos and it just happened that three to five people will come in in a week or two. You know this is most likely a viral infection. Deafness, one side or the other side. And it's interesting that the viruses can get to the central nervous system through the blood. But most importantly now, as we recognize it, they can actually go up the vagus nerve from the stomach into the brainstem. Within two, three days, at least in a mouse model, they'll be in the brainstem, causing severe brainstem infections or brainstem symptoms in human. It oftentimes goes to the heart, causing chest pain, sometimes true myopericarditis and endocarditis. It can cause arrhythmias and a number of other symptom, symptoms. You oftentimes will see the muscles. There are very few viruses that actually go to the muscles. A number of acute virus infections can cause body aches. But that's probably because of the immune response. But only one group of viruses that routinely will go to a muscle, heart, and the brain. And that's enteroviruses. It can cause acute breakdown of muscles to the, to the degree we call a rhabdomyolysis. And also it can cause significant joint pains and true arthritis. This has been well reported with the Coxsackie B viruses. And this is called pleurodynia, or Burholm's disease, as described by the British physicians. It's a very severe pleuritic chest pain, typically in the right upper part of the abdomen, but it can be anywhere around, in, around the torso. You can see the genital urinary tract. It's, it's probably the most common viral causes of what we call epididymitis, or testicle infections. And we'll present some data at the, to this year's uh, annual uh, IACFS ME meeting on the involvement of female genital tracts. You can oftentimes go to the skin and the patients will have lesions in the mouth. Just to kind of, un so everyone understand this. If you look at the polio epidemics that occurred in the 40s and 50s, there's very high infection rates, but there's a very, very few cases of paralysis. So we take the patients, the, the one or two people that develop paralysis, and, you, and, and epidemiologic studies show that if you go around the neighborhood, you check everybody, and there's about 100 people that are shedding polio virus in the stool. But 90% of them are totally asymptomatic. They don't have disease, okay? Or they have very minor gastrointestinal symptoms, not that even we'll call home about. They will become immune. 10% will develop flu-like symptoms, and these are the patients that you don't exercise them. Franklin Roosevelt, the President of the United States, had the flu-like symptoms, and the White House physician told him to go out and run. In a day or two after that, he developed paralysis. 
you don't exercise when you have enterovirus infection. That's well documented with poliovirus infection and eventually also with non-polio enterovirus infection. This is a study by the British investigators in town here. I think Clemens, Naren, Galbraith et al. published in 1995. This was a blinded study looking at the serum of chronic fatigue patients versus controls. They were able to find the viral enterovirus RNA, the gene of the virus, in 41% of the patient's serum, only in 2% of the controls. In the white blood cell layer, or called the Buffy code, it was 27%. The NIH of America was not able to reproduce this result. And this was the point of contention. This was the point of disagreement, okay? Enoviruses became non-existent, and this disease was said to be psychogenic. There was a basis for it, okay, because we are not on the same page. So after my son became ill, I started looking at medical papers. I started realizing the importance of enoviruses based on the work done in this country. We started looking at it with my son's help. We started doing the RT-PCR test looking for enovirus in chronic fatigue patients. Our initial studies, you know, of 131 patients, uh, we actually were able to find the viral RNA in 50, 50 patients, that's 38%, as versus 4% of the controls. These patients tested more than once, that they were positive more than once. That's the criteria that we use so we don't have a false positive result. They have to be positive at least twice with the call of positive. So from, for the first six years up to 2000s, we, we spent much of the time doing these RT-PCR, some 2,500 blood samples out of 510 patients, and we were able to find it in 35%. Very similar to the British study. Bedridden patients, we tend to find it more often, and when the patient was moderately ill with an energy level about four to five, we can find it about 12%. So the sicker you are, the more likely we're gonna find this, this virus in the blood. Then later on, we use a slightly different technique to preserve the RNA in the blood so we can collect the blood a little bit easier. We did 226 patients, and we found in 29% of the patients based on one blood draw. And when we did repeat quantitative RT-PCR to just quantitate how much virus are we actually talking about in the blood samples, then we realized how low these levels were. The median value was 53, and the mean value was 200. So we're talking about very little RNA here. Previous studies did not quantify how much viral RNA in the blood. So some people probably was detecting at a sensitivity of 4,000, and other people, are, we were probably detecting at about 10 to 100 range. That's probably why some studies found it, some, pro some studies did not find it. The problem is, I always thought about this for many years, that RNA is hard, we, we can hardly detect RNA in the blood. So where are they? Okay, can we actually find it somewhere else that we can have an easy access to? Here's a study that was published by the British investigator again. This, here's a patient that committed suicide and, and, and died. And the brain samples, heart samples, those biopsies from the hypothalamus and brain stems were taken. And viral RNA was found in these areas. And the RNA sequence showed about 83% homology with Kawasaki B3. This is the only case reported in the literature. I'm sure there will be more um, data that uh, Andrews is going to be publishing on, on the, the body donation. The, we ask ourselves the questions, where can you find this virus easily? That will basically help us to understand what they do in the body. Brain, muscle, and heart biopsies are very hard to come by. You have to have a large piece of biopsy in order to show these viruses, but also these viruses disseminated to these areas. So it's almost like looking for a needle in a haystack. What about the primary site of infection? If the virus is still in the brain, in the muscle, in the heart, and these type of organs, is it still possible they are still in the original area of multiplication, such as the throat or the stomach? We decided to, to not subject patients to throat biopsies because it's very painful. The stomach biopsy was much easier. And by the time I look at these patients, we already had 100 patients. I already had biopsies. The reason I showed this, this is actually a very helpful clinical finding. As you know in the quite, uh, definition of MECFS, there is sore throat and cervical lymphopathy. Okay, but there is very little attention to the abdominal symptoms, which most patients actually have. Patients often complain of pain up here. Here's the, the, the rib cage, end of the rib cage. This is where the stomach is. 
They oftentimes have pain in the right lower quadrant, where roughly about the appendix is, and that's the end of the terminal ilium, as I've shown you the case before. They oftentimes will have tenderness in the left lower quadrant, that's either the small bowel here or the colon, which are actually able to show viral protein or viral RNA in these areas. So we undertook a study, and we published this on the stomach biopsies, and it turned out we locked out. Here on the top two panels, you can see the extensive amount of viral proteins in the stomach biopsy. All these brown spots are actually viral proteins using what we call an immunoperoxidase technique. Here, you see much less. That's what we call one plus. This is a negative sample, a patient that we could not find any viral protein here. So initial data we published, we showed that out of 165 patients, 82% of the patients that actually were positive for the viral RNA and 20% of 34 controls, and most of these were blinded samples from another studies, they were positive. If we use 2 plus as the, the more extensive viral protein as a positive test, then 53% of the patients actually have a positive test and only 5% of the controls. That basically gave us a specificity about 94%. The most important part is that when we try to correlate with function, this is where it made, it made a lot of sense to us. 84% of the patient with two plus staining were actually totally disabled versus 46% of 71 patients with no or one plus staining actually were totally disabled. The more viral protein you have in the stomach, the more likely you're disabled. Today, we have done 504 samples, 82% were positive, and 53% showed two plus staining, exactly the same as when we initially published this. We also detected enterovirus RNA more often than the controls. This, we took almost two plus years to try to accomplish this. So if we can find the viral protein and the viral RNA in some of the samples, can we actually try to grow the virus out of the stomach biopsies? Well, we tried over probably 130 samples. 9% uh, of the samples grew in the first cell line that we reported. 14%, only three out of 22, grew in the second cell line. And the third, third study using this uh, human lung embryonic fibroblasts, okay, we were able to find a 9 in 35, 26%. But it's interesting that most of these in infections, the viruses don't kill the cells. They live happily in there. You have to actually look for them to see the viruses actually there. In this last culture, that there was some cell death. But none of the viruses really survived this culture t um, experiment, so we can't really characterize it further. So the other ways that we're trying to figure this out, well, this is just the first to show you that we can also see this in other tissues. A patient that complained of persistent throat pain and tongue pain, we are able to find the viral protein in the posterior biopsy of the, of the tongue. Here's a patient that had chronic sinus infection. Actually, this is a patient who was totally healthy and then got sick every month for two years, along with the rest of the symptoms of MECFS. And she had sinus surgery. We retrieved the sample, and we can see it in the sinus lining here. That's the viral protein. Here's the control with the uh, control antibody that did not show it. This is the next thing we worked on. The, pa this, the detail of this uh, investigation will be presented at this year's uh, IACFS ME meeting. What we're trying to look for is can we see actually how this virus survives by finding the double-stranded RNA that was postulated long before by the British investigators in 1993, okay? Here is a staining for the viral protein, as you can see before. This is an extensive amount of viral protein infected cells here. Here's the double-strand RNA. Very different than here. Almost like you start off here, then you got a whole bunch of virus cells. This is very reproducible. Sometimes it's at the base of the, depending on how the piece works, the cells actually grow in this, this type of direction, like this. It's actually at the basis of the, of, of, of the specimen. Here's the highly magnified areas. You look at the two areas here, if you focus on these four cells here, the staining are quite different, okay? Here is, I show this, I think, every year, but I hope I can spend a little time just to explain what all these things mean, okay? What is such a big deal about the double-strand RNA? The double-strand RNA is like the seeds of the weeds. It's like the spores of bacteria. You can't kill them. You can pull out the weeds, you can pull out the roots. You can kill the bacteria with antibiotics, but you can't kill the seeds and the spores. Double-stranded RNA 
can persist in the tissues after the in initial infection. Some of these double-strand RNA will open up using a virus enzyme, so two all of a sudden become a whole bunch of these guys. Then your cell will start getting really busy, okay? Part of this will be translated into viral protein, which we can see in the stomach. Part of it may become defective viruses, which will have difficulty growing, but we are able to show it. But all this action here will stimulate the immune response, such as interferon, neutralizing antibodies, total receptor activation. Then you activate the 2 prime, 5 prime synthase, RNA-L, the doctor, a number of physicians here have done nice work on, is, is activated, okay? This is activated to chop down these single-stranded RNA so they become smaller pieces. But Dicer, which is an uh, enzyme that cleaves double-stranded RNA, can also chop some of these double-stranded RNAs down. Then you end up with some of these smaller pieces. We think there are little innocent bystanders here, but they may have serious consequences. They may have a serious impact on our cell function. We know double-stranded RNAs can be silent siRNAs or microRNAs, so they can silence our gene or modulate our gene function. Maybe it's by this type of mechanism that the virus actually is exert its, our, its impact. But before long, as these, these RNAs are disappearing, more of it will hook up, back up into the double-stranded form. Remember, you can't kill off this double-stranded RNA. So this cycle will go up again. This is maybe why that you have the cyclical nature of this illness. Some of the patients, even in the remitting type of patients Dr. Bell mentioned, these things would be closed up. But as you keep stimulating it by exercise and activity, this will open up again, you'll relapse. But if the patient has a whole bunch of this type of stuff, they are the ones that tend to be really sick, as we have demonstrated with the stomach biopsies. So diagnostic approach to MECFS. You know, I, I think you heard a lot about definitions and all these things before. My interest in this is how do we figure out the, you know, what viruses are responsible for this? History. I still believe an cl old clinician's approach works. You can tell the difference between influenza and a common cold. You can tell the difference between Ebola virus and influenza, right? Can we tell enteroviruses from other viruses? The answer is yes, you can. In some cases, you just have to try harder. You have to know what they do in order to understand what they are. So initial events leading to the symptoms of MECFS. One of the common things that we hear from people are traveling. In our part of town, people like to go to Mexico, Las Vegas, Sin City, Hawaii, and they often get sick after they come back. Water exposure, people go to the lakes and you know, have water skiing, swimming, they'll be sick. But not everyone gets sick. For instance, the recent family that went to Arrowhead Lake, which is very close to where, where, where I am, and seven people swam in the creek. Two people came down with the illness. The, one of the five children came down with hand, foot, mouth disease, which is classic enterovirus infection. The dad came down with MECFS, a last of two years. So resp respiratory gastrointestinal infection, that type of symptoms, flu-like illness, persistent fevers for a long time. There are relatively few infections that can give you long fevers like that. Influenza rarely lasts more than a week in terms of the acute flu-like symptoms. You can certainly have complications of H1N1, that will last forever, okay? But that's how we tell. It's very common for physicians to use steroids. I noticed in the hist case history of one of the patients um, uh, here, and also in America, we give steroids like if it's holy water. Steroids pull out the fire very quickly, the patient feel wonderful uh, for a few days. Then a few weeks to months later, they come down with this dreaded disease. We physicians sometimes don't realize what harm we have done. This is, I tell every, every doctor now, you don't use steroids until the patient's, unless the patient's life depends on it. Surgery, oftentimes will precipitate an event like this, but if a patient has appendicitis or perforated diverticulitis, that makes them much more to be enteroviruses. We have proof of this. Vaccination, recently just saw a patient after a uh, influenza vac vaccine develop MECFS. But if you take a careful history, the patient was already sick 20 years ago for about a year or two with the same thing. We just brought it back on. So these things can recur if you shift the immune response with vaccinations, which I won't talk about. Ill contact. One patient came in and said, my, my, my daughter has fifth disease, and I developed it two years ago, and I have not felt well since. My energy level is less than 50%. I have horrible headaches. 
these things will be readmitting, and but every one month or two months, I'll be sick for two months. So uh, she actually had parvovirus B19 DNA in the blood. That's not enterovirus, but that treatment for that is totally different. We give them IVIG, as Jonathan Kerr has nicely demonstrated. Tick bites may give us hints as different diseases. Prior infections in the childhood, to me, is quite important. This tells us if these patients have actually had recurrent infections as, as, as children, sore throats, ear infections, colds, tonsillectomy. This is an important history. You don't do a tonsillectomy unless the patient has had recurrent sore throats. So the patient can say, I've never been sick as a child, but had tonsillectomy at age, five, age four, I think the patient had recurrent sore throats. Asthma tells us the patient has an aberrant immunologic response, as in, like my son. Other type of allergies, neonatal fevers in the first month, we have actually found enteroviruses in this quite often. Detailed review of the medical records of the tests is already done, and the type of history is helpful in defining what they have. How do you diagnose chronic enterovirus infection? High index of suspicion. You have to understand the acute infection in order to understand the chronic infection. Few physical signs, oral and tongue ulcers. I, I used to show you these, uh, these pictures. This is very, very helpful. That's usually very indicative of uh, enteroviruses. Abdominal and muscle tenderness. Remember, very few muscle, very few viruses can infect the muscle and persist there. Actually, enterovirus is the only group. Abdominal symptoms, I just showed you before. Testing in, in America, we can do neutralizing antibodies for 11 of these enteroviruses. This is helpful. We found this in 1998 by serendipity. We still use it, but then now we feel that the time we need to move on. Now we need to find the viral protein. We need to find the viral RNA in order to convince the rest of the people. So we use immunoperoxidase tests to look for viral proteins in the uh, stomach and all the uh, other relevant tissues, which we, well, we won't talk about in detail. Then you have to correlate the symptom with the test result. What is the pretest probability the patient has chronic enterovirus infection? If the pretest probability is 10%, I, I won't even bother doing this. Okay, if the, if the pretest probability is 80%, the patient may have enteroviruses, then a positive test basically give us a certainty of 100%, okay? Treatment. Many people have talked about this before, symptom-based uh, treatment, specific antivirals, buconorail I've used in four patients. The, the result was a mix. There are new drugs of this kind coming out uh, probably in the next five to seven years. This probably won't work well for chronic disease, but if you have these type of drugs to treat acute infections, then there should be much less chronic infections. So in that sense, it will be very useful. Future antiviral drugs we'll talk about, other antivirals like excyclovir, gencyclovir, or uh, valcite that Dr. Andreas uh, talked about, cytovivir, I think Dr. Peterson also used. We do find these, these drugs useful in selected patients. And if those patients truly have Epstein-Barr virus, CMV, or HHV-6 infection is predominant uh, pathogen, I think these drugs are useful. Unfortunately, those are not the predominant pathogen. So the immune modulators, Ampogen, I think a number of physicians have used this uh, much, I mean, more than I have. I only have four patients that's been on Ampogen. IVIG is still used in selected patients. It does help in, in patients, especially with severe pain. It can relieve the fatigue, but it's, it's not as dramatic as the relief of myalgia. Interferons, the combination of alpha and gamma interferon in, co in combination are helpful, but it's very expensive, very hard drugs to tolerate. Then we use herbal immune boosters. <clears throat> I want to give you a clinical example. You, you, the, uh, you saw this last year. Here's a 15-year-old Chinese-American male developed a flu-like illness during the basketball season. He was actually on the varsity team as a, as a freshman. He was a very good player, kept playing because he had to have tournaments. When he finished the tournaments, he basically had become totally bedridden and homeschooled for the next four years. He graduated from home, okay? After that, he actually felt better. He went to a local college. Then he saw people playing basketball, so he played basketball three days in a row. After the three days, he developed a severe, diffuse muscle pain, which he did not have in the beginning. The beginning, he just felt so tired. His muscle enzyme level was 30,000 when I met him the next day, less than, normal is less than 250, and 10,000 in a week, and then it was normal in two weeks. So I asked this, time, this question last year, 
What was the outcome of the infection? Was he cured or was he, did he relapse? How many say relapse? Okay. How many say he was cured? One finger. Okay. You're honest. Okay. He was cured of this infection. I also show this slide a number of years in a row, just to illustrate that there is, it takes two to tangle. If there's a virus, there has to be part of the immune system is not doing right in order for the virus to survive. But these viruses are not destructive as like as in HIV. So, but the immune system normally should supposed to tilt into this direction to fight the virus. That's called a Th1 response. You produce these cytokines, you get rid of the virus. But if you shift into this direction, sometimes it's because of pre-existing type of illnesses like allergies, ster steroids was given for asthma, for, for rashes, periods. Two weeks before the menstrual period, you're in this direction. Pregnancy, vigorous exercise, vaccination, and prior closely spaced infection. Tilt you into this direction, and then you have persistent infection. In this young man, he was in this direction because of the vigorous exercise, okay? He couldn't eradicate the virus because he was exercising too hard, and the immune system was shifted into a Th2 dominant direction. But four years of rest, the virus gradually, gradually went down. His immune system improved. And when he started exercising again, the virus surged. But this time, he locked out. The immune system tilted into this direction. He actually killed off the infected muscle cells. And he eradicated the virus infection. This is very telling. He did not take anything. He just did this on his own. Few males get better in this way. Um, we do not know why this happens. This is the next thing which we've been using as pretty much first line, is oxymetrine. Now, you heard this before. Initially, when we did it, this was not double blind and controlled. I, I'm sure that would be a criticism of this, but uh, we asked for funding, but we couldn't get any funding. So we, initially, we did 100 patients. We gave them the Chinese survey. The next 104 patients, we observed them. 52 of the treated patients got better, and only 6% of the control group got better. Then we treated the control group. 54 of those patients got better, so it's about 52%. It turned out the age, sex, and duration of illness did not correlate with the response, but severe brain involvement tended to give us the non-response. So 52% of the patients with positive antivirus protein in the stomach biopsy responded, and 56% with negative biopsies responded. And today, we, we've given to 366 patients, and 52% of the patients responded to oxymetrine. I won't go through this, and this one I also showed you last year. The side effects of this is basically increasing pre, the pre-existing symptoms. The mechanism of how this works was shown in the last slide is that it will shift the immune response toward the Th1 direction. When you do that, then the patients tend to fight harder and sometimes can be intolerable, okay? So you move up the dose fairly slowly, the increase in body aches, headaches, abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, fatigue, Palpitation, people who have chest pain, sinus congestion, sometimes fevers, bladder symptoms, dizziness, and increase in insomnia can all happen. A few people did have did gain weight. They, they felt very hungry when they took this. A couple of patients developed edema, joint, increased joint pains. One patient had increased blood pressure, rashes in a couple of patients out of 200 or 300, dry eyes, dry mouth, and herpes outbreaks after the patient abruptly stopped it. That usually means the virus, the immune system was trying to tilt into the right direction, but when we stopped it abruptly, then it shifted back into the wrong direction. <laughs> Equilibran is an American-made um, oxymetrine preparation. My son and I actually formulated this so patients can have easier access to this. We also given it to about 300 patients. The response rate is 52%. Some are dramatic, some are not as dramatic. 88% of the patients who switched from the oxymetrine from China to Equilibran had continued improvement. This one is probably better tolerated, but we gave the patient uh, a very uh, slow escalating dose. Because increase of pre-existing symptoms are common, just like before. So we basically start the dose very slowly. We give a patient either a half a tablet to a one tablet a day for two to four weeks. If they tolerate it well, they can go out faster, and then you move up the dose. Usually, in three months, we should know the, the response. If there's a positive response, even as minor, we, we, we keep on going with it. In six months, if the patient doesn't respond, we, we, stop, we stop. 
Here is a demonstration of the enterovirus protein and the double stranded RNA in patients before oximetrine treatment, equilibrium treatment. You can see a lot of viral protein, a lot of double stranded RNA. Here's two years of treatment. You can still see some little brown spots here, but very, very little. And you don't see any double stranded RNA here. The patient stopped the treatment about eight months ago. She just came back about two weeks ago. She, her symptoms actually relapsed, but she wasn't quite as bad. And this, this occurred after a viral illness her children brought in. She's back on the Chinese herb. She's doing well. I, I think we, we established that enteroviruses can be a persistent infection. And it's a fairly uncommon manifestation of a very, very common disease. Okay, And we can actually demonstrate it viral persistence in the stomach biopsies. So if people don't believe that stomach biopsies are adequate to address the brain and muscle and heart issues, I can't do anything better than that. I mean, we like to have muscles and heart and lung biopsies, uh, muscle biopsies, to correlate with it, but those samples are hard to come by. I think immune modulators can be helpful for now, but we do need to develop better antiviral drugs. But first, we have to understand how exactly this viral persistence works. Thank you.